Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Shalwa Brenica here. I will discuss the summary of organizational behavior, an evidence-based approach of Fred Luthen's 12th edition, with some points from other authors and researchers for you to understand organizational behavior better. First, we need to define the difference of human behavior and organizational behavior and why is it important. The definitions that you will hear came from Carol M. Kopp of Investopia and from Simeo Retrox Cyber Learning System. Human behavior, as described by Simeo, refers to the physical action of the person that can be seen or heard like reading, writing, talking, walking, etc. It is exhibited with thoughts, feelings, or emotions, and sentiments. Human behavior refers to activities that human beings possess which is influenced by factors such as thoughts, feelings, emotions, culture, attitude, values, ethics, and authority. These behaviors are exhibited inside and outside the organization. However, in the organization, each human behavior is controlled by the same sort of factors affecting the organizational behavior of that particular company or agency. Organizational behavior refers to actions and attitudes of individuals and groups toward one another and toward the organization as a whole. And it is the effect on the organization's functioning and performance. It is the collective behavior of the individuals or groups within the organization. The behavior in the organization outlines the mission and goals of the organization and defines how its people interact within one another within its setting. It also speaks to where an organization fits into the bigger picture. All organizations have an internal culture that is unique. Each employee contributes not only a certain skill set, but also a personality with inherent values and beliefs. And those values and beliefs will determine how they interact with work groups, with other employees, and toward management. In an organization, you will have interactions with other individuals. You have to contend with the organization itself. Your behavior in an organization is referred to as organizational behavior. As per Carol M. Kopp of Investopia, uh, as of March 14, 2023, organizational behavior is the academic study of how people interact within groups. The principles of the study of organizational behavior are applied primarily in attempts to make businesses operate more effectively. <laughs> it is the combination of psychology, sociology, economics, and communication by studying the human behavior in groups. It strives to find ways to improve human efficiencies in workplace settings. Human resource managers use human behavior analysis in improving training programs or in to get job satisfaction and thus reducing employee turnover. In addition, the research and discoveries from organizational behavior help organization develops leaders and promote innovation. Apply organizational behavior findings help managers revise methods on compensation, employee evaluation, and even the ways in which the organization is configured. All are in order to improve performance. Organizational behavior takes a long-term view in enhancing organization profit profitability. Studies have shown that corporations with happy, motivated, engaged employees tend to do better over the long run than companies that do not.
If the previous generations and today's generations will be asked, what are the major challenges in today's environment? Some would say turbulence in economy and dangerous geopolitics. At organizational level, understanding global competition and diversity and trying to solve ethical problems and dilemmas are one of the major challenges. But basic premise and assumption in managing people or human resource of an organization is the major challenges in today's environment. Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, said that people are the key to a successful organization. Technology can be purchased and copied, but people can't. Human bodies can be cloned, but not ideas. Personalities, motivation, culture, values can't. Study of 300 companies in 20 years resulting to findings that extensive trainings, trainings like empowerment can result to performance benefits, while operational initiatives like quality management or advanced manufacturing tech do not. Cost for human resources is known as human capital or education, experience, and skills. Investing in human capital results to desired performance outcomes like increase in productivity and customer satisfaction. Human capital can go beyond which is now called social capital or who you know, like networks, connections, and friends, which can still go beyond which is now positive psychological capital or who you are, like confidence, hope, optimism, and resiliency, which who you become like possible authentic self. There is a growing research that have findings employee psychological capital is positively related to their performance and desired attitudes. Famous Bill Gates had observed that technology dramatically changes monthly or even weekly, but the human side has not changed or will not change that fast. Problems facing by managers of human resource have been around since the beginning of the civilization, recognized by Jewish, Christian, and Islam religions. 3,000 years ago, charismatic leader was Moses. He led people from Egypt to Palestine. Then well-known consultant was Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and the higher authority was God. This part of the Bible covered topics like charismatic or servant leadership, management of conflict, empowerment, management of chance, and non-financial incentives. Problems and solution in human resource stays the same, but environmental conflicts or context changes all the time. In 1980s to 1990s, managers are preoccupied with restructuring their organization to improve productivity and meet the competitive challenges in the international marketplace and quality expectations of customers. Organizations offered some short-run benefits like lowered cost, improved productivity. In 1995 and 2005, found that most incentives or initiatives were restructuring or downsizing, cost reduction programs, globalizing supply chains, creating shared services, and Six Sigma, or Almost Perfect Quality Program. At this era, compensation of top management was invested in the stock, which led to high-risk mergers, acquisitions, and winner-take-all environment. This type of behavior, and of course, many other social, economic, and geopolitical factors led to the financial crisis and stock market crash at the end of 2008. The focus of the organization were on financial markets, government bailouts, massive unemployment. Then expect on psychology of corporate environment noted that after years of downsizing, outsourcing, and a cavalier corporate attitude that treats employees as costs rather than assets, most of today's workers have concluded that the company no longer values them, so they, in turn, no longer feel engaged or committed in the company. Paradigm is introduced by the philosophy of science historian Thomas Kahn. It means 
broad model, a framework, a way of thinking, a scheme of understanding reality. Popular futurist Joel Barker, paradigm establishes rules, written or unwritten, defines the boundaries, and tells how to behave within the boundaries to be successful. Blend of baby boomers, traditionally trained, and Gen Xers, or in your face, and millennials and younger tech savvy has led to a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift has paradigm effect of great uncertainty. That is why there are resistance to changes. It is difficult to change old management paradigm to new. This organizational behavior has the goal of helping today and tomorrow managers make the transition to the new paradigm. According to research, there is a need for a new perspective for management. How did they come up to that conclusion? According to Douglas McGregor, Fury X, it is said that employees are lazy and only interested in money. So the solution? Monetary incentive plan, ensure job security, and good working conditions for you to have a high moral and good performance as its product. But Fury X approach is no longer works with the current environmental demands on the new paradigm shift. Employees are extremely complex that there is a need for theoretical understanding backed up by research before application can be made. According to Pfeiffer and Sutton, they believe that today's managers knew about this, but still, they don't do it. They come up with the five sources that prevent majority of the managers from effective implementation and sustainability. And those are 1. Hollow talk 2. Debilitating fear. Three, destructive internal competition. Four, poorly designed and complex measurement systems. And finally, five, mindless reliance on precedent. So, there is a need to use the new perspective called evidence-based management or EBM. There's a growing concern that the gap between theory or research and practice seems to be be widening. According to the Academy of Management Journal, many organizations do not implement practices that research has shown to be positively associated with employee productivity and firm financial performance. The problem largely comes from the fact that when it comes to people, everyone is an expert. Concentrating only on the creation of knowledge by rigorous scientific methods and pay too little attention on the translation and diffusion of research findings to practice. It depends only on narrow personal or client experience and depend too much on limited anecdotes and personal experience. Now, to help close the theory research practice, gap must be built from both sides, practice and academic. Practitioners may take on more of a practitioner scientist role and academics must assume a more scientist practitioner role. Historical roots. Founding fathers of social psychology, Kurt Lewin said, no action without research and no research without action. There is no question that the early practicing management pioneers such as Henry Fayol, Henry Ford, Alfred Sloan, Frederick Taylor recognized the behavioral side of management, but they did not emphasize the human dimension. They let it play only the minor role in comparison with the roles of their hierarchical structure. French engineer turned to be an executive Henry Fayol wrote the first book about management. This was during the World War I in the largest coal mining firm in Europe. He said that organization is social. Hawthorne studies provide historical roots for the notion of a social organization made up of people and make the generally recognized starting point. In 1924, Hawthorne Works in Western Electric Company outside of Chicago said and discussed about the relationship between light intensity on a shop floor of manual work sites and employee productivity. It was divided into two, task group and control group. Task group 
in early phase showed no increase or decrease in output in proportion to the increase or decrease of illumination, while the control group with unchanged illumination increased output by the same amount overall as the test group. Subsequent phases brought the level of light down to moonlight intensity, but productivity still increased. Something besides the level of illumination was causing the change in productivity. That is called the human complex. The illumination experiments provided the impetus for the future study of human behavior in workplace. Subsequent phases of the Hawthorne studies were conducted. First, a study in relay room. Operators assembled relay switches. This is to test specific variables like length of workday, rest breaks, and method of payment. In each period, yielded higher productivity than the previous one. Even when the workers were subjected to the original conditions of the experiment, productivity increased. Something was still not being controlled that was causing the change in the dependent variable or output. Another phase was the bank wiring room study. The bank wires were placed in a separate test room. Observer and an interviewer gathered objective data for the study. Department regular supervisors were used. The main function was to maintain order and control. The results were opposite to the relay room experiments. There was no continuous increase in the productivity. Output was actually restricted by the bank wires. The workers decided that only two equipments was a proper day's work, but the management divide demanded two and a half. The norm of two equipments represented restrictions of output, rather lack of ability to produce at the company's standard of two and a half. The incentive system dictated that the more a worker produced, the more money they can earn. The best produ producers would laid off less. Yet, in the face of this management rationale, almost all the workers restricted output. One interesting aspect of Hawthorne studies is the contrasting results obtained in the relay room and bank wiring room. In relay room, production continually increased throughout the test period. The relay assemblers were positive versus the bank wiring room. Blatant restriction of output was practiced by disgruntled worker. To answer the difference between the two, questionnaires were administered. Relay assemblers said they felt better in the relay test room. It is because of the six reasons. First, it was only in a small group. Second, they liked the type of supervision. Number three, they are satisfied with the earnings. Number four, they, are, they like the novelty of situation. Number five, they have interest in the experiment. And lastly, they like the attention they received. All these variables, experimental design, group dynamics, style of leadership and supervision, rewards, and more, separate the old human relations movement and an evidence-based approach to the field of organizational behavior. Human can't be treated like chemical or physical elements. They can't be controlled or manipulated. Therefore, when question arises or problem evolves, the first place to turn on for an answer is the existing body of valid evidence. Unfortunately, the answer is not always found in the body of valid evidence and must be discovered through appropriate research methodology. There is enough evidence that Organization behavior principles can be provided for the effective management of human behavior in organization. William points out, meta-analysis shows that works and the conditions under which management techniques may work better or worse in the real world. Meta-analysis is based on the simple idea that if one study shows that a management technique doesn't work or another study shows that it does, an average of those results is probably the best estimate of how well that management practice works or doesn't work. Starting with theory. The purpose of any theory, including those found in organizational behavior, is to explain and predict the phenomenon in question. 
Theories allow the researcher to deduce local propositions or hypotheses that can be tested by acceptable research design. Don Hambrick points out, a theory, by its nature, is simplification of reality. Theory and research go hand in hand in evidence-based management. Theory is the answer to queries of why. The use of research design is at the very heart of scientific methodology. It can be used to answer practical questions or to test theoretical propositions or hypotheses. There are three designs, experiment, case, and survey. The primary aim is to establish the cause and effect relationship. The validity of studies are two, internal and external. Organizational behavior is defined as understanding, prediction, and management of human behavior in organization. It accumulates evidence and tests theories by accepted scientific methods of research. Cognitive, behavioristic, and social cognitive theories can be used to develop an overall framework for an evidence-based approach. Edward Tolman's Cognitive Theoretical Approach he believed that learning consists of the expectancy that a particular event will lead to a particular consequence. Behavior is best explained by discognitions. Most of the major psychology journals said there's cognitive explosion than behavioral school. Cognitive approach dominated in analysis in personality, perceptions, and attitudes. Ivan Pavlov and John B. Watson authored Behavioristic Framework for their famous classical conditioning. It's the experiment to formulate the stimulus response explanation of human behavior. While modern behaviorism, author B.F. Skinner, is the most influential psychologist, initiated operant conditioning. Albert Bandura's social cognitive theory, or SCT, is more comprehensive than cognitive or behavioristic approaches. It recognizes cognitive and behaviorism. The social part is what individuals learn by being part of a society, while the cognitive portion is the influential contribution to human motivation, attitudes, and action. Basic Human Capabilities According to Bandura's SCT he defines symbolizing as employees process visual experiences into cognitive models that then serve as guides for future actions. Four thoughts explained as employees plan their actions, anticipate the consequences, and determine the level of desired performance. Observational explained as the employees learn to observing the performance of reverent and credible others and the consequences they receive for their actions. Self-regulatory explains that employees self-control their actions by setting internal standards and by evaluating the discrepancy between the standard and the performance in order to improve it. While self-reflective, or the employees reflect back on their actions and perpetually determine how strongly they believe they can successfully accomplish the task in the future given the context. Globalization, diversity, and ethics have forced management of all types of all organization to totally rethink their approach to operations and human resource. IT has led to a boardless, flat world, according to Thomas Friedman. He said, we now entered the third phase of globalization. Let's take a tourism industry as an example. The first phase, we needed a travel agent. Second phase, e-ticket replaced the travel agent. Third phase, you are now your own travel agent. 
Brunswick Corporation declared that there's a shortage of human resources who possess global leadership capabilities. John Welch of General Electric said, John Welch of the future can't be like me who spent the entire career in the U.S. The next head of General Electric will be somebody who spent time in Bombay, Hong Kong, Buenos Aires, and so on. We have to send our best and brightest to overseas to have training that allow them to be the global leaders who will make the General Electric flourish in the future. Recent study found that cultural differences such as race, ethnicity, and religion affected the attitudes and behaviors of managers toward profit and other related business concerns. Example, Germany preferred autocratic leadership than U.S. Germans are more obedient and expected their managers to be less participative and consulted less. Japanese do not appreciate performance-based incentive systems such as weekly bonus. They do not like to be singled out for individual attention and go against the group's norms and values. When Japanese nod yes, it means no. In conclusion, people are influenced by multiple cultures like national, regional, organizational, functional, and professional. Even people from the same country still have different beliefs, values, and behaviors. Counterparts from other cultures are becoming savvy in how to deal with foreigners and thus may not be typical of their own culture. Because of complexity of culture, simplistic categorization may initially be helpful but turn out to be poor predictors of behaviors. The solution? Organizations must have ready access to cross-cultural training tools. Organizations must develop learning skills that will on the spot compensate for cultural knowledge gaps. And lastly, organizations must develop and use a global mindset. Diversity means much more than ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, full range of ages in career and geographic experiences. Head of Huge Society of Human Resource Management described organizational diversity initiatives should not simply focus on getting people of color and women in the door, but embracing an inclusive culture to maintain these employees. SHRM identified outcomes for effective diversity management. First, creating a work environment or culture that allows everyone to contribute all that they can to the organization. Two, leveraging differences and similarities in the workforce for the strategic advantage of the organization. And number three, enhancing the ability of people from different backgrounds to work effectively together. Reasons for the emergence of diversity here in the U.S. Older workers, women, minorities, and with education now enter the workforce. The workforce is now different from the past. U.S. Department of Labor said majority of new workers are women and minorities. In micro level, there's equal opportunity and diversity in all levels. Small minority of the Fortune 500 board directors are women. According to U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, Women, on average, continue to trail men in terms of pay for the same types of job. Prospects for the future may be better because women now make up more than half of all college students, half of all medical and law students, third of MBA, half of the middle managers, quarter of university presidents, well presented in senior management levels in healthcare and NGOs. To discuss about the most recent legislations, let's start with Age Discrimination Act of 1978. This law at first increased the mandatory retirement age from 65 to 70 and then was later amended to eliminate an upper age limit together. Number two, Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. These laws give full equal opportunity protection to pregnant employees. Number three, Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This law prohibits discrimination against those especially qualified individuals challenged by a disability and requires or to reasonably accommodate them. Number four, Civil Rights Act of 1991. 
This law refined the 1964 Act and the reinstated burden of proof falls on employers to eliminate discrimination and ensure equal opportunity in employment to employees. It also allows punitive and compensatory damages through jury trials. And lastly, Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. This law allows employees to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave for family or medical reasons each year. Philippine Laws on Diversity in the Workplace Prohibition on Discrimination Against Women, RA 6725 This law considers it discriminatory discrimination when your employer favors a male employee over a female counterpart when they consider giving out promotions, salary raises, training opportunities, and other benefits. Extended Maternity Leave Law, RA 11 210. This entitles all female workers with 105 days of maternity leave, paid with 100% of their average daily salary credit. This act prohibits employers from discriminating against women as they'll still provide their female employees benefits even if they're on maternity leave. Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, RA 7877. Sexual harassment includes physical forms, malicious touching, gestures with lewd insinuation, overt sexual advances, or verbal forms such as request for sexual favors, lurid remarks, and use of objects, pictures, or letters with sexual underpinnings. The Solo Parents Welfare Act, RA 7972. You are considered a solo parent if you are solely responsible for a child's upbringing. In addition, you are eligible to get a solo parent ID to get access to benefits. The solo parent benefits include a flexible work schedule, seven-day parental leave, and non-discrimination at work. Unfortunately, there are no penalty clauses under this act to hold employers liable if they refuse to comply. Anti-Age Discrimination in Employment Act, RA 10911. This mandates companies to hire employees based on their competence and not their age. As such, employers can publish job ads that indicate their age preferences. The penalty for violation is a fine of 50,000 pesos to 500,000 pesos, imprisonment of three months to two years or both. Magna Carta of Disabled Persons, Republic Act 7277 and 9442. Employers must give a qualified disabled employee the same terms and conditions of employment as a qualified non-disabled person would have. Meanwhile, in RA 9442, it's unlawful to make fun of or mock a person with a disability, whether in writing, words, or actions. International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, Presidential Decree 966, aims to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. This decree prohibits the promotion and incitement of racial superiority or hatred, whether in acts of violence, dissemination of ideas, or propaganda activities. Moreover, Employers can't discriminate against an applicant or employee on any aspect of employment. Additionally, one is not allowed to utter racial slurs, display racially offensive symbols, or make derogatory remarks about a person's race, color, or ethnic origin. Lastly, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, RA 8371. It recognizes, protects, and promotes indigenous cultural communities or indigenous peoples. This act extends to providing the same employment rights, opportunities, and privileges available to all as an employer would grant any other company member. According to this act, it's unlawful to discriminate against any indigenous peoples with respect to the terms and conditions of employment on account of their descent. This also prohibits denying indigenous people any rights and discharging them to prevent them from enjoying the rights and benefits. The laws given in the previous slides, along with the lawsuits and threat of lawsuits in the U.S. and in the Philippines, have put teeth into diversity. 
Importance of diversity to organization is the realization that diversity can help them meet the competitive pressures they currently face. Firms that aggressively try to hire and promote women and minorities are going to end up with a more talented and capable workplace than those that don't take such a proactive affirmative action approach. Recent academic research points out the complex linkage between work group diversity and work group functioning, but there is also growing practical evidence that diversity leads to innovation and often breakthrough competitive advantage. More and more organizations are entering into international arena. If domestic organizations have promoted diversity, they expand diversity, they will be accustomed to working with people who have different cultures, customs, and social norms. Moreover, multicultural organizations are defined as follows. 1. Reflects the contributions and interests of diverse cultural and social groups and its mission, operations, and product or services. 2. Acts on a commitment to eradicate social oppression in all forms within organization. 3. Includes the members of diverse cultural and social groups as full participants, especially in decisions that shape the organization. And 4. Follows through on broader external social responsibilities, including support of other institutional efforts to eliminate all forms of social oppression. There are several stages that have been identified in leading to such a multicultural organizations. First stage, exclu exclusionary organization. Furthest from a multicultural organization, it maintains dominance of one group over all others in factors like age, race, education, and gender. They discriminate, but they still exist even if it violates the law. Second stage, club organization. It maintains privileges by those who traditionally have held power. They hire and promote, but only to those who have right credentials and perspectives. Third stage, compliance organization. They hire and promote women and minorities only for the sake of complying with the law. Fourth stage, redefining organization. Questions the core cultural values of organization as manifested in the mission, structure, technology, psychosocial, dynamics, and products and services. It engages in visionary planning and problem solving to tap the strength of diversity. And of course, what, they, what we want to achieve is multicultural organization. The core cultural values and an ongoing commitment to eliminate social oppression and promote dignity and respect for everyone throughout the organization. One example of a multicultural firm, Microsoft. It has diversity department and diversity advisory council. This is to maximize the company's performance through understanding and valuing differences. Recent studies said that 64% of firms don't solve the issues of racism and only 12% benefited from the program. So it is believed that there's a need to strive to achieve a multicultural organization. Individual approaches to managing diversity. There are two interdependent paths for these approaches, learning and empathy. Learning. Heart of learning is communication. Managers must openly communicate one-on-one -on -one regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, sex preference, religion, or those challenged with disability. Managers can also begin to develop personal style that works well with each member of a diverse group. Example, person with disability don't want special treatment. They want to be treated like everyone else but only asking equal opportunity in employment. In the learning process, managers can ask for feedback and how disabled people are being treated. Empathy. Empathy is the ability to put oneself in another's place and see things from that person's point of view. No discrimination has been put into action for a long time, yet many women still suffer from harassment in male-dominating field. The solution? Many managers have promoted women in min minorities to help in their careers. Those who have been promoted are hesitant because 
they didn't want special treatment or worry that they may not be able to reach everyone's expectation. Solution? Offer encouragement, guidance, and after the fact, backup support. Organizational approaches to managing diversity include a variety of techniques. Some involves testing, training, mentoring, and programs designed to help personnel effectively balance their work and family lives. Testing. These are usually culturally biased. Tests traditionally used in selection and evaluation are not suited or valid for a diverse workforce. One way to make tests more valid for diverse employees is to use job-specific tests rather than general aptitude or knowledge tests. Training Firms that adopted diversity training tended to have the following profile. First, it is large size. Next, there's a pos positive top management beliefs about diversity. Third, there is high strategic priority of diversity relative to other competing objectives. Fourth, there is existence of a diversity manager. Five, there is existence of a large number of other diversity supportive policies. There are two ways in which this training can play a key role in managing diversity. First, offering training to diverse groups. Another way is providing training to managers and other employees who work with diverse employees. Florida International University Center for Management Development, or CMD, provides diversity training for employers in South Florida, where there were Latinos and African Americans in higher percentage. Trainees into groups are based in ethnic origin. At the end, Managers and employees relate that they have better understanding of their personal biases and ways to improve the interactions. Sometimes, training games are used to help participants focus on cultural issues, such as how to interact with personnel from other cultures. Research has found that the major key to success of diversity training is top management support for diversity, mandatory attendance for all managers, long-term evaluation of training results, Managerial rewards for increasing diversity. Trainings must be linked to business outcomes in order to produce actual behavioral change. The major problem encountered is transfer problem. Trained employees do not transfer this training back to the job. Mentoring. Mentoring is used to help support members of a diverse group in their jobs. Socialize them in the cultural values of the organization and pragmatically help their chances for development and advancement. Benefits that mentor can provide are the following. One, identify the skills, interests, and aspirations the person has. Two, provide instruction in specific skills and knowledge critical to successful job performance. Three, help in understanding the unwritten rules of organization and how to avoid saying or doing the wrong things. Four, answer questions and provide important insights. <clears throat> Five, offer emotional support, six, serve as a role model, and seven, create an environment in which mistakes can be made without losing self-confidence. The downside of the mentoring is that mentors may become overly protective and encase those they mentor into a glass bubble by shunting them into jobs with adequate pay and professional challenges, but eliminate all chance of further advancement. Guidelines for Mentoring Program 1. Top management support is secured for the program. 2. Mentor chooses protege who is both involved in minority and majority circles. 3. Give both a mentor and proteges an orientation. Mentors are taught how to conduct themselves and the proteges are given guidance on the types of questions and issues that they should raise with their mentor so they can gain the greatest value from the experience. 4. Mentor and protege meet with the support staff of the program to see how well things are going. 5. And last, overall impressions and recommendations are solicited from both mentors and proteges regarding how the process can be improved in the future. In the typical family today, parents have jobs and work family issues. 
dual career family were proposed through alternative work schedules, which allowed the parents flexibility in balancing their home and work demands. The most common alternative work schedule arrangements are flex time, compressed work week, job sharing, and telecommuting. Flex time allows employees greater autonomy by permitting them to choose their daily starting and ending times within a given time period called bandwidth. Most companies are using this concept and similar ones to help their employees meet both organizational and personal demands. Compressed work week compresses the work week into fewer days. The downside, productivity, profitability, and employee satisfaction is still to be determined. Job sharing is a splitting of full-time position between two people, each of whom works part-time. Telecommuting. Companies use on-site assignments of the personnel. Companies are able to reduce the number of people who are in the building at any one time, cutting the amount of work, space, and parking spots. These programs emerge due to large number of women began entering the workforce, solve conflict on family responsibilities that results to absenteeism, job dissatisfaction, turnover intentions, and stress. Next, the following are the programs for dual career families and working parents. First, child care or elder care benefits. These may include child care facilities at the work site and transportation of aging parents to a senior citizen center. Next, adoption benefits. These include leave policies and reimbursement for legal fees, medical expenses, agency or placement fees, temporary foster care and or travel expenses. Leave time off policies. They may include free time off for no reason or prior notice and paybacks for unused day offs. Convenience benefits. This refers to on-site services such as dry cleaning, ATM machines, postal services, and video rentals. Health promotion benefits. These include such things as fit fitness centers, health screenings, flu shots, and stress management clinics. Education assistance benefits. Tutoring programs, tuition reimbursement, and scholarships are some of the examples of these benefits. Housing assistance. Relocation, assistance, seminars, preferred mortgage arrangements are also sample of housing assistance. Group purchase programs. Legal and financial planning assistance, discounts with local merchants, group auto and homeowners insurance, and fleet arrangements for auto purchases. And lastly, casual day program. These are the days for dress down days to have everyone relax in an one, the job family atmosphere unique programs did you know that pepsi company has concierge service like getting all change line up for babysitter and the like next eastman kodak they have humor room room is provided where employees can share jokes and have fun lastly ben and jerry Ben & Jerry provides Joy Gang for birthday and anniversaries and any other occasion that they want to celebrate in their workplace. Ethics and Ethical Behavior in Organizations Ethic involves moral issues and choices and deals with right and wrong behavior. Not only individuals and groups but also a number of relevant factors from the cultural, organizational, external environment determine ethical behavior. Cultural influences on ethical behavior come from family, friends, neighbors, and education, religion, and media. Organizational influences come from ethical codes, role models, policies, and practices, reward and punishment systems. External forces having impact on ethical behavior include political, legal, economic, and international development. What may be viewed unethical to one, but differently by another. Those given influences acting interdependently serve to help identify and shape ethical behavior in today's organizations. There is increasing evidence of a positive impact that ethical behavior and corporate social responsibility programs have the bottom line performance. Organizational Context, Design and Culture Historical Roots 
Chester Barnard said in his book, The Functions of the Executive, Formal Organization as a System of Consciously Coordinated Activities or of Two or More Persons. People, not the boxes, make up a formal organization. Dissatisfied with classical bureaucratic, that authority should not be top to bottom. Human being plays the most important role in the creation and perpetuation of formal organization. Modern Theoretical Foundation, the Development in Organizational Theory. First, view of organization as a system made up of interacting parts. There must be an input of external environment. Analysis of organization in terms of their ability to process information in order to reduce the uncertainty in managerial decision making. Second, contingency approach. There is no single best way to organize the organizational design must be fitted to the existing environmental conditions. Third, ecological view of organization. It is a process of the survival of the fittest. There is a process of organizational selection and replacement. Fourth, information processing and organization learning. Based largely on systems theory and emphasize the importance of generative over adaptive learning in fast changing external environments. What is meant by learning organization? Frederick Taylor's learning on scientific management must be transferable to workers to make the organization more efficient. Chris, Arigiris, single and double loop. Single loop is meant by organization's capacity to improve by learning without change in its basic assumptions. Double loop. Learning reevaluates the nature of the organization's objectives and values. It involves changing the organization's culture. Peter Singh from systems theory and made the important distinction between adaptive and generative learning. Adaptive learning means first stage adapting to environmental change, example, TQM, benchmarking, G Sigma, customer service initiatives. Still, organization struggles. While in generative learning involves creativity and innovation, going beyond just adjusting to change to being ahead of and anticipating change. Learning Organizations in Action There are a number of ways that the learning organization can be operationalized into the actual practice of management. For example, managers must be receptive to new ideas and overcome the desire to closely control operations. Many organizations tend to do things the way they have done in the past. Learning organizations break this mold and teach their people to look at things differently. For example, several years ago, British Petroleum, or BP, was bogged down in their bureaucratic structure and control procedures, accumulated a huge debt, and had some of the highest costs in the industry. Then, a new CEO took over, sold off the firm's unrelated business, and implemented a corporate strategy mostly based on speed and rapid learning. In the turn of the century, BP had a learning-driven culture in place. The old bureaucratic boundaries were down. Everyone in the firm shared knowledge with everyone else, and BP became the low-cost producer in the oil company. As was done at BP, the move toward a learning organization entails breaking out of the highly controlled, layered hierarchy that is characteristic of bureaucratic structures. The accompanying OB in action, breaking out of the box, gives a number of real-world managers examples of problems with bureaucracies and how to think outside the box and bust out of them. In other words, the beginning point is establishing a learning organization is to recognize that bureaucracies have too often become an end to themselves instead of supporting the vision and goals that require adapting to the changing environment and learning how to do that. Besides breaking out the bureaucracies, another way to operationalize the learning process in organization is to develop systematic thinking among managers. 
This involves the ability to see connections among issues, events, and data as a whole rather than a series of unconnected parts. Learning organizations teach their people to identify the source of conflict they may have with other personnel, units, and departments and to negotiate and make astute trade-offs both skillfully and quickly. Managers must also learn especially how to encourage their people to redirect their energies toward the substance of disagreements rather than toward personality clashes or political infighting. Another practice of learning organizations is to develop creativity among personnel. Creativity is the ability to formulate unique approaches to problem solving and decision making. In generative learning organizations, creativity is most widely acknowledged as a requisite skills and ability. Two critical dimensions of creativity which promote and help unleash creativity are personal flexibility and a willingness to take risks. As a result, many learning organizations now teach their people how to review their current work habits and change behaviors that limit their thinking, whereas typical organizations focus on new ways to use old thinking. Learning organizations focus on getting employees to break their operating habits and think outside the box. Initially, organizations involved in labor-intensive manufacturing of toys, apparel, shoes, moved to hollow designs that outsourced the entire process of making of their products and left them to focus on product design and marketing. Then in recent years, manufacturing of all kinds has moved outside of United States and also financial, accounting, and even medical service processes have left hollow organizations. For example, much of manufacturing on all levels and industries was outsourced to China and other developing countries, while information processing and customer service was outsourced to India and Philippines. This movement of entire process outside the organization left what has been termed the hollow organization design, and when just parts of the product or service are, are outsourced, it's called the modular organization design.